All right, good. We're good. See, I was already assuming the worst, you know. But hey, you're right. See, I thought the batteries don't work, and Shane knows, you know. So, okay, okay, we got it all good. Well, we're good. All right. Well, here we go. I, I like to begin begin our, our our message here with a list I I found, and it's titled "How to Know If You're Going to Have a Bad Day." So if, if you experience any of these, you're going to know you're going to have a bad day. You wake up face down on the pavement. You call crisis prevention hotline and they put you on hold. <laughs> you see a 60 minutes news team waiting in your office. <laughs> You turn on the news, and the first thing they are showing is emergency routes out of the city. Your twin sister forgot your birthday. <laughs> the, the, the bird singing outside your window is a buzzard. You wake up, and your braces are locked together. You call your answering machine, and they tell you it's none of your business. <laughs> now, here's the one you really got to be careful of. Your car horn goes off accidentally and remains stuck as you follow a group of hell's angels on the freeway. <laughs> oh, I see that. I love that. You know, some of this is, is a little over to the top, which makes it so funny. You know, I still think of the 60 Minutes film crew in your office. Oh, boy, that, that would be like, whoa, what, what happened here, you know? But, but any one of those situations would instill a, a sense of worry in us, right? I, I wouldn't imagine your anxiety levels would go through the roof. Hey, exiva or, uh, you get out of the city now. You know, here, here's the, the route to take. You're going to be like, whoa, what's going on? Fear's going to overtake you, right? Now, imagine if you live in an area and you're surrounded by people that hate you and cannot stand you because of your beliefs. They can't stand you because of your faith. They view you as an enemy because of your desire to worship your Lord and Savior. You are being heavily persecuted because of your faith in Jesus Christ. Nobody, nobody will hire you for a job. Nobody will buy the goods you're selling. People are stealing from you. They're plundering from you. Your neighbors are making life as difficult as possible on you. Do you think if that was a situation, you would have a reason to wake up in fear every day? Do you think your life would be full of worry and anxiety? Of course it would. Luckily for us, we, we are not persecuted like the early churches were. We don't have to face death for our beliefs. But we do have constant concerns and worry that we deal with every day. There's a lot of reasons to cause somebody to live in fear. So today, the title of today's message is, message is Be an Overcomer, Do Not Fear, Part 2. Do I need to adjust the air before we move forward, Miss Barry? No, you want me to turn the air on? Yeah, yeah okay. I'll turn it up just a, just a tad. We aim to please. There we go. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> now, we talked last week about the church of Smyrna and how they were heavily persecuted for their faith. They lived in poverty because of their faith. They faced many hardships because of their faith. But Jesus gave them some encouragement and he also gave them a command to help them endure their suffering they were going through. 
This is the verse we talked, two verses we talked about last week. I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you're about to suffer. Indeed, the devil's about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death and I will give you the crown of life. Now Jesus says, I know your works. I see all that you're going through, all that you're doing. It does not go unnoticed. So we have to remember that. When we're, when we're working for the Lord and it feels like nobody notices, just remember Jesus notices. Then Jesus says, I see all the suffering you're going through because of me. All, all the ridicule you face on a daily basis. The poverty you live with. All the blasphemy you deal with, all because of me. I see it all. And then Jesus says, indeed, indeed, without any question, yes, you're going to be tested for a period of time. Testing will bring out your true colors and show your true condition of your heart. We go through testing so God can either show us how strong we are or show us what we need to work on. But one thing we have to remember, like Brother Shane said, is that trials and tribulations will bring out your true colors, the true condition of your heart. You cannot hide behind a fake persona when you're going through trials and tribulations. But the one thing I want to touch on more today then we didn't have because we didn't have time last week is the, the command Jesus gives us do not fear any of those things do not fear anything now the word fear is translated from the greek word phobia phobia phobias which is defined as to fear to avoid to flee from, to frighten, to dread, or to be terrified of. In 2018, Barnes and Noble revealed that books on anxiety and fear disorders increased by 25% that year. Anxiety disorders are the most common mental illness in the U.S affecting one in five adults. Millennials were, were revealed to be the most anxious generation ever. Worry and fear breeds anxiety. There are more people dealing with fear than you realize. So the question is, what does the Bible say about fear? If you will, turn to 2 Timothy chapter 1 if you have your Bible. If not, I'll be displaying screens or, uh, scriptures on the screen. Or nowadays, some people use their phone, however you want to look at it. But turn to 2 Timothy chapter 1. Now, a great example to look at is Apostle Paul. Look at everything he went through planting churches. Spreading the gospel, spreading the good news. He was beaten, he was robbed, he was stoned, he was imprisoned, he was shipwrecked. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. You could say he, he, was, he was not afraid to take a lick. He'd take a lick, get up, dust himself, off, dust himself off, and start over again. Now the last days of his life on earth are spent where? in a Roman prison. He is sitting... It, now, what is he doing in this prison? Is he sitting around mad at the world? Blaming everybody else for the state he is in? 
Is he feeling sorry for himself? Why me? Woes is me. I'm stuck in his prison cell. No. He's writing a letter to his young protege, Timothy. He is sending him a letter of encouragement while he is sitting in a prison cell. He is writing him a letter, preparing him to take, take the baton from Paul. You're fixing to take this ministry over. You're fixing to have the weight of the world on your shoulder. Paul is preparing Timothy for what is ahead. Paul first acknowledges Timothy's genuine faith in the gospel. He reminds him how he was called into ministry and how faithful he is. Then he gives him another reminder here, verse 6. He says, Therefore I, I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Two key words here. Stir up. Stir up the gift of God which is inside of you. Everybody that has accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior has this gift inside of them. What gift is that? It's the Holy Spirit. Jesus talks about it. He says, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, He will teach you all things and bring to you remembrance of all that I have said to you. The Holy Spirit will teach you. He will remind you of what Jesus said. That is, He will teach you God's Word. He will remind you of it. The Holy Spirit will be a guiding force for all of us if we let it. This is why Paul reminds us to stir up that gift inside of us. Before you open a can of paint, what do you do? You shake it up. You stir it all together. You open the can and there's that beautiful color you want in. Then Paul goes on to give Timothy another reminder. A reminder to prepare him for hardships, difficulties he's going to face. A reminder to help him with the many storms he is going to encounter in his lifetime. Verse 7. It says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. This is one of the first verses that God used to speak to me about fear. This is the verse, when I reflect back on it, I reflect back on this verse when I'm getting consumed with fear from life. Now, there's different types of fear. I don't have time to go into all this, explanations of different types of fear. But what we're talking about is the fear of obstacles that are placed in your way, difficulties we face, the many storms in our life, when you're being called to do something, when you just get consumed with fear. One of the things that helped me the most about dealing with fear is to understand where does fear come from? This verse right here tells me that it does not come from God for God has not given us a spirit of fear. God would not give us something that would destroy us. The spirit of fear is not from God. That's why we are commanded 365 times in the Bible, do not fear. So if, the, if, if fear does not come from God, then who does it come from? The devil himself. The master manipulator. The entity that seeks to devour and destroy like a lion. If you think about it, fear is one of the most influential emotions in the world. What do we deal with? There's fear marketing. There, there's political campaigns based off of fear. 
There's fear in news stories to drive ratings. There's even fear in sales, right? Hey, that deal won't be here tomorrow. I know it's a good deal. It won't be here tomorrow if you don't sign the papers today. Fear is all around us, and fear is used continually to manipulate us. The devil knows one of the best ways to destroy you is through fear. When the devil, when the devil is successful in instilling fear in you, he is able to manipulate you. He can control you and hinder you from doing great things for yourself and great things for God. We have to remember, the devil is constantly looking around for somebody to devour, to destroy, to eat you up like a lion. And his best weapon to do this is fear. Now when we're about to do something and we begin to get overcome with fear, maybe it's speaking in front of a big crowd, maybe it's about you're, you're fixing to take off on a track event, run a marathon, uh, go into a courtroom, whatever it is, you're about to do something and you become so consumed with fear. All we can think about is everything that can go wrong and we don't think about anything that can go right. Well, we get so terrified we're about to get sick. We, we, we start to become frozen with ter terror. We can't speak. If and when we ever get in this state before we go, go do something, we need to ask ourselves one question. Ask yourself one question. What is the devil working so hard to keep me from doing? What is he trying so hard to keep me from realizing that I can do? What great thing is he putting all of this work into to keep me from accomplishing? Now there's three things I consider very important in my life right now. It's faith, Family, and this is going to sound crazy, but fitness. Job, it's about number 10, but it's something you got to do, right? But I consider fitness very, I, I, I consider it very important to me because it all coincided my fitness journey with my faith journey. And I'm, I'm a firm believer that God used fitness to help me overcome addictions in my life. Addictions to alcohol, addictions to pills. He helped me overcome addictions through fitness. In February of 2017, I was about two months into my journey, my new walk, after recommitting myself to Jesus Christ. And I was talked into doing an event called Friday Night Lights. I was fairly new into going to this CrossFit gym. And in February, they had this, this uh, community-wide workout. It was called, they would do it on Friday nights. It's called Friday Night Lights. And I got talked into doing this, right? And I was like, well, okay, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll do it. I'll do it, whatever I can do. So we go to a gym I've never been to. I walk through the door, and it looks like there's nothing but NFL players in there, MMA fighters, powerlifters, Arnold Schwarzenegger imitators. Nobody has shirts on. All these guys don't have shirts on. Muscles popping out everywhere, and there's little old me. What? Uh, I don't know about this. I'm like a fish out of water, right? I'm just like, man, oh, I'm going to make a fool of myself. Man, this is like a 30-minute workout. You got to do dumbbell snatches from the ground, burpees, jump over a box, right? And I was like, there's just no way. And it just kept building in me, building in me. And I'm starting to like, oh my gosh, now I'm about to get sick. I'm, I'm eyeing the garbage cans in case I do get sick. And I'm listening to this voice. You, you can't do this. You're a loser. You're going to stand out like a sore thumb. All of it, right? Okay, I've had enough. I'm fixing to slide out the door. Turn around and look. Oh my gosh, there's my cousin and his wife. What are you doing here? Y'all don't know nothing about this. Well, now I can't leave, then I'm going to look like a chicken, so now what do you do, right? 
Oh my gosh, this is just getting terrible. I don't know what to do. I am just consumed with fear. I've never been that afraid in my life. And they announced my heat. So I go to my gym bag, get my wrist wraps for support. And I had this, these, these tags I bought. You put on your gym bag. And it had scriptures on them, right? And this first scripture I seen was this one right here. For God has not given us the spirit of fear. And it just hit me right then. What is the devil working so hard from to keep me from plowing forward right here? What I gained that night, what I gained that night was last place in the standings. Okay, that's cool. But I gained some lifelong friendships with people that I met that night that still stand to this day. Christian friendships. People that we lean on with each other. You know, I know what's going on with their kids. They know what's going on with my kids. And then what else I gained was a memory of being able to overcome my fear and tell Satan, not today. I get reminded of that night a lot when I get overwhelmed with life. So the point number one I want to make is the spirit of fear does not come from God, but from the devil. When fear starts to overcome you, ask yourself, what is the devil trying to hold me back from? What is he trying to keep me from accomplishment? Accomplishing. For, for years, this is the whole meaning of this verse to me. But there's a little bit more to it. God does not give us the spirit of fear, but he gives us the spirit of what? Power, love, and a sound mind. You don't have to look any further than the apostles or followers of Jesus for the example of the spirit of power. The Bible says, Then the seventy returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. He said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Then Jesus tells them this, Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Jesus gives us the power and authority to overcome anything the devil sends our way. Now the question is, where does this power come from? How does Jesus give us this power? Before Jesus ascended to heaven, He told the apostles, remain in Jerusalem. Wait for the promised helper that the Lord was sending. Then He speaks these words to them. Acts 1.8 But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. You receive the Spirit of power from the Holy Spirit. The power we need to face anything that is thrown our way comes from the Holy Spirit. Proverbs 28 says that the righteous are bold as a lion. Boldness is defined as a quality of having a strong appearance, the willingness to be confident and courageous. True boldness comes from the Holy Spirit. We have to remember that power is within us. We just need to stir it up inside of us. But what else does God give us? Let's look back at our main verse. 2 Timothy 1.7 For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but power and of love. God has given us a spirit of love. We experienced love before the message today. Gave, stood up and gave people a hug. We express love, right? The spirit of love 
causes us to miss individuals when they're not at church, right? If you ever hear about somebody's moving on to a different church and it just kills your insides and though you might never see that person again, that's the spirit of love. The spirit of love causes us to love God, to love to worship God. The spirit of love causes us to love all of God's creatures, plants, animals, whatever. The spirit of love causes us to love God's word, the Bible. The spirit of love is where true care and concern for others comes from. Lastly, the scripture tells us we're given the spirit of the power of a sound mind. Now, this is the ability to make wise decisions. Not decisions based off of fear. Oh my gosh, what am I going to do? Oh Lord, oh no. Not those kind of decisions. Sound decisions. When we overpower fear with the Holy Spirit, we are able to make sound decisions, good decisions, wise decisions. And of sound mind means that God has given us the power to be self-controlled, self-disciplined, to overcome what? Confusion and panic that comes from fear. This is why we are told, Paul says, stir up those gifts inside of you. We have been given the ability to stay in control. All we have to do is stir up those gifts inside of us. The greatest times of overcoming in our life are not during good times when everything is is what we would say is smooth sailing, but during times of great tribulations. During times in our life when things are not going so well for us. Maybe it's financial hardship. Maybe it's medical diagnosis. Maybe it's family problems. Maybe it's a loss of a loved one. Maybe you're facing a lawsuit. Maybe you've been wrongly accused of something and you're dealing with that. Whatever it is, These storms are the greatest times to be able to overcome your fear. I want to close with a story that we all know. (laughs) Good deal, buddy. Jesus and his disciples had (laughs) had just finished feeding multitudes of people. Two fish, five loaves, finished, they fed thousands of people. I think it was 5,000 men plus their, their wives and children, right? Great miracle. Couldn't even imagine witnessing that. And after this is finished, Jesus sends the disciples away in the boat to the other side of the sea. When the boat reaches the middle of the sea and waves and wind begin to pick up. Scripture says that the disciples were in trouble far away from land for a strong wind had risen and they were fighting heavy waves. It would be safe to say they're in the boat and they're in the middle of a storm. I I, I think about this when I see a movie, you know, and the wind's blowing and the waves are going. And I mean, you've seen Deadliest Catcher in there fishing, the boat's going everywhere. When I've heard this story, I've never really thought about them being in the middle of a storm. But the disciples are in the middle of a storm in their boat. And what happens? It says, about three o'clock in the morning, Jesus comes towards them walking on the water. When the, when the disciples saw him, y'all remember they're in a storm, it's raining, winds going everywhere. Oh, we're scared. Now you see a ghost. Whoa, man, what is that? They were terrified, right? In their fear, they cried out, It's a ghost. Look, guys, it's a ghost. But Jesus speaks to them and says, 
Don't be afraid. Take courage. I am here. Then Peter called to him, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you walking on the water. Jesus says, yes, come on. You got it, buddy. Come on. Peter must have listened to Jesus' words. Take courage. Don't be afraid. I am here. And we have to remember, this is in the middle of a storm. There's no smooth water, no perfect condition. It's waves everywhere. Peter steps out of the boat. Peter listened to Jesus. What happened? Scripture says, so Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water towards Jesus. Peter is walking on the water. As long as Peter was focused on Jesus, he was able to walk on the water. He's looking at Jesus, walking towards Jesus. Then what happened? Then he got to noticing these waves and the wind and the rain and the storm he was surrounded by. He, be, he got terrified and he began to sink. As soon as Peter took his eyes off of Jesus and focused more on the storm around him, he began to sink. When he let the fear of the storm he was in consume him, he began to sink. Does this sound familiar? It, it does to me. I, I, I deal, there's something weekly I deal with this on. But what happened next? Peter cries out, Save me, Lord. He shouted, He shouted, Save me. Peter cried out, Lord, save me. I love this verse. What happened next? And immediately, not, hey, give me a minute. Hey, I'm busy here. Immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, Oh, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? Immediately, Jesus saved him when he called out to him. You have so little faith, Jesus said. Why did you doubt me? We spend so much time living in fear and doubt when all we have to do is keep our eye on Jesus and call on Jesus and immediately He will give us a hand to safety. Ask everybody please stand.